Is right now. Check one two. Check one two. Can you say something? Just gotta check. Hello, everybody. There I'm we go. To be here with Constantine. Awesome. People can hear you. I, I wasn't sure. I just wanted to make sure. Hi, everybody. Yes. Welcome to the Honor YouTube channel. We are back. This is the third Honor Live of 2023, episode 82. And yeah, let us know from where you're tuning in in the chat. Didn't have the time to type in the welcome message, but tell everybody in the harmonica world that we're online and feel free to ask questions about music, about harmonica. Adam and I are happy to answer. And please welcome with me, Adam Glasser. I want to see a lot of clapping hands in the chat. Thank you for joining us today. I suppose you're in London right now. Is that true? That's right. I'm in South London. Fantastic. And we were just thinking about like when the when we met for the first and single time in person, right? Which was at the NHL Harmonica Festival. Mm -hmm. Were you And whether it was the, some time ago. Yeah. Were you at the um Hona World Festival in 2017? Oh, let me think. 2017. I, was, I played there then, 2017 uh, in Trossingen. Maybe I didn't play. So it's every four years, uh, right? Yeah. So I was at the festival in 23. Mm -hmm. And I played there, 2013. Yeah, but I definitely was there in 2017. Mm hmm. So, oh yeah, I do remember. I mean, we definitely mm. met again at the jazz session too, right? Uh, probably, yeah. 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 Oh, Pete Ewart is tuning so, in. Hey. Um, you. Yeah. Should I be able to see... Um, to see the chat? The, the YouTube, or is that down to you? Oh no, that, that's on my side. I can just read the questions out loud. Oh, okay. okay. We also I won't have you. any problems with, like, yeah. uh, <laughs> questions in other... Languages, I guess. Mm. Last time I had to learn some French. Refresh my French. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So, that's quite a while ago. So, what was the last harmonica festival you visited? Mm, um, virtually, I would say the October 2021 festival. The Harmonica UK. Okay. And I've been to very few festivals apart outside of the UK. I'm not really a harmonica festival guy. Yeah. Um, nothing against it. It's just that I'm, you know, my world is trying to play the harmonica in a jazz context where I'm the only harmonica player. <laughs> right. <laughs> very true. What, so what do you like about harmonica festivals and what do you don't like? Well... The great thing about harmonica festivals is you get to meet people like you <laughs> as we met in, in Bristol all that time. And also, I mean, it is very interesting. The, the, the Hona Festival was amazing because I got to play with Antonio Serrano and Jens Bunger. And we did a Toots Thielmans tribute. Oh, I remember. And, yeah, and, I was at that um, church. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's fantastically interesting and especially, I mean, going to Trossingen, you know, where I hadn't been to Trossingen since 2011, when I went out at the request of um, Richard Weiss, who was the production manager then, and he introduced me to the Melody Star. The Melody okay, Star. Right. Do you, have you come across that? I, I never had one, um, I think but I'm interested. I think it'd be too difficult for you to play. Okay. <laughs> I was just thinking <laughs> about it notes. because... So nice. uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm only joking, but um, it's great because it's solo tuning, you know, same as. And I am a great. D does it also have the repeated C note? Absolutely. OK. It's got that two C. So. It gets you used to it. If you're a chromatic person, you have to get used to the two C's. Yeah. Which is not a problem for you. I mean, sometimes I do play chromatic and it really confuses me all the time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I 
love that. You know, I absolutely love it when somebody as accomplished on the harmonica as you thinks, uh, you know, the chromatic gives me a bit of a problem because I don't know one end of a blues harp from another. <laughs> yeah. I find it incredibly difficult to play. I have got away with playing it um, a few years ago because uh, there was a production of The Italian Job. You know the famous uh, movie with Michael Caine? Oh, I'm not it's sure. This famous 60s movie with the British actor Michael Caine. And so they did a, a, a tour with showing the film on a big screen, but with a live orchestra playing the music. And there's quite a lot of blues harp in that. And so many people, I mean, I do a lot of sessions and many people I have to be very careful because sometimes people say, oh, the harmonica. They don't know the difference between the harmonica you play and the harmonica that I play. And um, so this was a blues harp. And <laughs> I spent a lot of time just getting my head around it because it's so different. So, so was it all like second position blues? I don't even know what second position is. What yeah. is second position? <laughs> is it, does it mean starting on... It means play, playing in the key a fifth above the key of the harmonica. I see. You've just taught me something very important. And that's uh, the main thing for the blues players, right? I yeah. mean, I don't think in positions, but... Yeah. I mean, well, I tell people about like it all the time. that gives you like a mixolydian scale, doesn't yeah. it? It gives you a major scale with the And that's five. the thing most blues players don't know, that it gives you the right. mixolydian scale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, yeah. But can I just ask you this? Worlds. How do you, pl if you can answer this in a minute, how on earth do you play such intricate lines on a blues harp? I mean, first of all, you got to be able to play all the notes, right? Using yeah. all the bending, the bending and overbending techniques. Yeah. But how do you get such rhythmic accuracy? That's the thing that blows me away, you know. I mean, I hear this in, in you know, if I hear Howard Levy playing, I hear like incredible rhythmic accuracy, which is not difficult, which is impossible on the chromatic um, because of you have to change holes. Whereas if you, you know. Well, I mean, there's obviously some stuff that lays out easier than other stuff on the diatonic. And especially, I don't know if you think about it, If you are only playing on one hole, you can play very fast and rhythmically precise because, like, if you play the six-hole draw, the six-hole bend, for example, you're already, like, activating the blow reed vibrating so you could play a fast six-hole overblow right after. Mm -hmm. But I mean, That was a bad example, I, but if you play six-hole draw, you know... The six hole yeah. draw read is vibrating, and if yeah. so, it's super easy to play a six hole overdraw afterwards, overblow afterwards, right? Because that's when the draw read also vibrates. Mm -hmm. So, but if, if I was to play you a line like this, say, could you play something like that? That was uh, in the key of of C minor. Oh, I'm okay. starting on a G7. I'm not trying to roast you, by the way. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah that's, what that's the best like thing you... we can do on stream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't remember the, the thing you did on the dominant, but... <laughs> Something like that, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So when you play that, what do you think? How do you think of the notes? Well, it's... Uh... Definitely the harmonica itself has a three 3D model in my mind, right? Don't tell me I've frozen. Yeah, I think you're frozen. I can still hear you. Now you're back. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think my internet... I'll repeat the question. When you play that, how do you think of the notes? Yeah, it's really thinking about the harmonica itself as a 3D model in my mind. I see. Do you you don't imagine a keyboard? I don't. Sometimes, sometimes see, it's easier. But uh, yeah, this time it was the three D model I, of the I, instrument. I it's so interesting because I have a student who's very talented. Um, she's the communications secretary of Harmonica UK. Her name is Susie um, Colclough, and she's blind. 
She's only been learning harmonica with me since April of 2021. And she is unbelievable. Yeah. You, you'll meet her sometime. But she's unbelievable. The number of tunes that she's learnt. And she knows her way around a chromatic. She, can, she knows her way theoretically. And she has a visual kind of uh, a system in her head of like egg boxes. I don't even know what they are. But you right. see, if I just change screens, I, I only started playing the chromatic when I was like 28, 29. Wow. Before then. That's I'll, I'll comparably you, late. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you played late. piano before. Yes. Here's my first harmonica. Okay. Okay. So I'm 17 years old and my dad gives me this harmonica for Christmas. And I picked it up. I used to be able to play. So I tried to do that on this. And there's 16 holes. And I swear to you, if I had to try and do that now, I, I don't even know where I am on this. I don't play a 16 hole. And it, oh, it yeah. amazes me how people can do that. But with a 12 hole, I think it's doable because I started to think of that piano like... my whole route into playing and I think that um, Antonio uh, Antonio Serrano I think he's gone the same route yeah except except that he started when he was eight and he's just a genius and I can't tell you how much I admire him as well as um, who's he's a buddy when he comes to London uh, I sit in with him at his gig and then we go and play darts he's really into darts oh Can you really He's yeah, good he's at it. He's a very good dart player. But you know, everybody's got to have <laughs> he's like... He's good at everything. <laughs> ...their downtime. And when we finished, we were at the Pizza Express, and he says, um, can we go and play... I said, what? Darts? Darts? He said, you mean the things you chuck? He said, yeah. So we went with some friends, and we found this darts place in, in Hoburn, here in central London. But, I mean, coming back to the keyboard, Matthias Heiser is, as you know, he's also a brilliant keyboard player. And I think he uses... Um, he uses this visualization of the keyboard, which, which I encourage people to do, even if they don't play. Because yeah. I don't see how a beginner or somebody vaguely interested in getting musical literacy, I don't see how you could do that on, you know, on, on something like that. So um, th that's basically the routine. Having said that, you know, where I feel uh, almost like an admiration, envy of people who don't go down that route is that if you're learning completely intuitively just by practicing, y you also have a lot of freedom uh, just to play what you hear. And uh, I get that sense from you. I f I, in, when I hear you playing, I hear you like completely free of any uh, changing, you know, like railway points. You know, when a train goes on railway tracks and then you hear, and you hear them change gear to this key or to that. I don't hear any of that. I think you're like a free spirit. <laughs> and so, uh, in nice. a way, uh, I, in a way, I think what I'm encouraging people to, is both and is, you know, work out what the notes are. I mean, like yeah. Susie has spent a lot of time. She had a lesson with me a week for nearly two years. Spent a lot of time practicing. And it's 90% it's down to the student. You know, people say, oh, you know, the teacher, but it's not. It's down to the, pr it's what do you do in between your lessons? Of course. Do you go on, yeah. you, do you go on Facebook or do you practice your instrument? Yeah. And she's somebody that, man, she's put in the time. So true. Anyway, but you are I, I, so right. I feel like it's so important to develop at least some sort of a vis visualization of the instrument, right? Yeah. I mean, for me, it works with the piano if I'm on the C harmonica. Mm -hmm. So there, then I can think of that stuff. But otherwise, I'm more into like the 3D model. 
what is a three? Could you explain what a three D model? Uh, oh, it's like really like it? a three D harmonica in my mind, and I'm jumping around. You know. What what are the three dimensions? Is it blow and draw, or is it something else? Yeah, it's definitely blow and draw, and then the different ranges of bends and overblows available, right? Right. So there's like right. the space in terms of depth. Yeah. Yeah. The the number of options to get actually play the notes. Yeah. And I mean, it could be also 2D, you know, if uh, mm. people just look at the layout and it's just like, uh, how do you call that in English? Marking by numbers or like drawing by numbers, basically. Yeah. You know, so that could yeah. be like your your phrase could be like. Oh, I see, like, like, like almost like a zigzag kind yeah. of thing. I But see. I prefer like a 3D kind of thing. Right, right. That's very cool. Could you could you play me a phrase and then maybe deconstruct it in terms of the three D model? Oh wow, that that's quite an exercise. You know, just what, like like a well, short what, musical phrase. Yeah, um, what made me realize it is uh, that um, I think Lee Sankey wanted to write a book on this, right? Yes, he, he, the brainstorming he, thing. He's he's done a whole lot of interviews quite a while back, and he interviewed people on how the visual picture that they had for the harmonica. Yeah. And my, I mean, sometimes phrases are only like focused on the structure of the diatonic harmonica itself, you know? That's not my How 3D do you do model, those it's just really like... Fast notes? It's just a lot of sliding sometimes, you know? And then, right. yeah. I would say there are different ways of playing fast on the diatonic, yeah. you know? Yeah. You have, like, breathing patterns. Mm -hmm. Then you got just, like, sliding, basically. And then yeah. incorporating bending notes and overblows. And the more you want to incorporate them the, yeah the more you got to find like um the tongue and mouth positions that require the least amount of change between the notes kind of yes you know yes. because like all right, of them right. have like a different resonance and stuff but you got to get them closer together so you can yeah fit them in a faster phrase um so yeah, we're just kind of against how the actual note is being taught, right? So yeah, I, yeah that's the other way. It's a bit like fingering, isn't it? You've got to find the right combination of, yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with the harmonica. I mean, obviously with the chromatic, with the two Fs and the three Cs, we've got like a mild version of your problem or, yeah. you know. But do you play everything on one harmonica no or do you have do you I mean, i mean in the sense that can you play um chromatically on one harmonica yeah but i don't prefer to just right. like I, i i don't feel like it would would sound nice <laughs> i see i mean yeah. i'm amazed and incredible what, what like people like otavio castro do Oh, really? I had him on the whole live. Castro. Yeah. I'm I'm afraid I've not come across him. Yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm ignorant about a lot of He's on the C um, harmonica only and he also has like a different kind different representation of the harmonica. His layout of the instrument, he actually like showed it on stream. It's not like a, anything you've seen before. It's just about like compressed notes and uncompressed notes. That's the only difference he makes. It's not like overband, overdraw, bending, whatever, you know? It's just the two groups. Would he still have his harmonica basically tuned to the Richter tuning? You yeah. Know, the ba, ba, ba. I see. So what he could do, he doesn't have a special tuning of his harmonica like Brendan Power. Yeah, just the regular Richter tuning. That's amazing.
that's I mean, I tell you, this modern world, man. It's crazy. I mean, I mean, yeah. that's even that, that's not even that modern, like with the old tuning, right? Um, yeah. The, our last guest was Sebastian Chalier from France, and he plays. Right. Um, which feels kind of more contemporary, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. You see, I, I'm a bit of an old school guy, which is that I think if you're going to play chromatic, play everything on on one instrument yeah. with the same tuning you know and and get your head around that because <clears throat> you know i, I mean yeah i, I would love I to like just carry, carry one instrument you know yeah like sometimes i think why not mm. learn the chromatic and just carry this you know <laughs> mm. but the, the, i mean the other thing is if you're trying to teach people to play and one of my major kind of activities is teaching anybody from scratch yeah um, is that if you if you do you use tab at all? I mean I mean would you, what do. do you think of tab? I mean I just got really good at it because of teaching, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but you see, if if I could wave a magic wand, I'd get everybody to use exactly the same tab system. In other yeah. words, you know, blow blow hole one, minus hole one. And I like to use asterisk for the slide. And that okay. way, that way, it's, you know, the, the reason I did that is, is because if you were writing something out on a keyboard, lyrics above, you imagine writing tab about, you know, lyrics. Isn't she lovely? You know, say you wanted to do that. You, you literally want to be able to get someone to play in the key that Stevie is playing. So you'd want to write a, a whole three with the slide in and blow for the first note. And don't just even just do that with the lyrics. They don't even need to be able to read music. Yeah, that's true. Um, so so I, I think that tab is hugely important. You know, plus, I'll tell you something. The reason I discovered tab, I used to be taught by Jim Hughes. Uh, did you ever come across him? No, you know, not Jimmy really. Hughes, there were two absolutely outstanding, you know, world-class classical players, uh, British guys, Doug Tate and Jim Hughes. You know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, there was no one to touch them. They could play the top range of classical, and they were great teachers. I had lessons with both of them. And Jim is a very tough teacher. He'll, like, totally roast you, you know, old school stuff. Ah, your sound is crap, you know. But, <laughs> I mean, he's got, he, he's a great teacher, you know, if you can... If you can handle that side of him. But the thing that he said, he said, oh, you know, tab is a waste of time. You just put the music in front of you and you just read like any normal musician who's playing classical music. And so I had this prejudice against tab. I was a tutor on, uh, which was must have been like 2009 or 10. Um, they said, oh, can you tab? Can you write tab? I said, ah, oh, yeah, but Jim says you, his tab is rubbish. I said, yeah, but they're people that are like very basic. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll tab. So then I got to play summertime. Summertime. I thought, what, what, what is E, uh, an octave above middle C? Um, what hole is that? I realized that I couldn't identify the holes oh, very wow. fast. Yeah. I knew what to play, but then I had to think, oh, okay, E above an octave above middle C, that's whole six blow. Yeah. Then I found myself writing in tab, and I found that it actually improved my reading and my security on the harmonica. Because I would go to the session, and, you know, I'd have some kind of, you know, you have like a, a phrase to play, and you end up here. And you end up that note, and then the next note is like... Uh, how the hell do you hear that? And I've, I had a lesson with Robert Bonfilio. And I said, Robert, how do you do that? And he, he told me a really great exercise, which is that he only practices scales in one direction. So what he'll do, for example, is he'll go... So, in other words... He said the principle is that you, you end the phrase and go back to the starting note. It's no, it's no oh, yeah. good going like all the way up and all the way down. 
but play up to their note. And so this, I had this like lesson with him, really amazing, full of information, um, in about November 2020, you know, during lockdown. And it changed the way that I think of practicing and how I get people to practice. And that y you, if, if you've ended up on a B flat, I don't even, and the next note is going to be something that you can't hear, then I would be in a studio with a chart, you know, and I would write in the tab so that I knew in those four bars gap, I'm going to have to go from that B flat to an F sharp draw hole six. Right. Know. Okay. So that is really important, I think, you know, tab. And so, uh, you know, it, it would be great if everybody used tab. I'm a kind of evangelist in that sense. <laughs> It's interesting. Yeah, I feel like I have nothing against tab. And also, um, from what I know, like people like, I mean, they are definitely guitar players, but also, for example, Bela Fleck, he doesn't read any music. Like, he can read banjo tabs, you know? And he wrote a concerto for banjo plus orchestra, just converting his fingerings in whatever notation program he program he uses just converting it to actual musical notes you know yeah and yeah. i mean the classical notation system is also kind of outdated you know i mean the problem with it is that the length or the duration of the note is just represented by symbols and not visually in that sort of sense like there are so many young people out there right now learning piano with these yeah. midi bars rolling through the youtube videos right and you can exactly see like how long you gotta hold the note i think those are like fairy wheels on a bicycle you know when you learn to ride a bike and you've got those little wheels when you're a kid i think you need to be rid of them as soon as possible you know um uh, uh, the ears the thing yeah that's what it comes down to, yeah, no, definitely. The, the, the ear is the thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But can I ask you, Constantine, if you were to tell me, like, some... F I love asking people what they like listening to. And um, I kind I kind of... There's long-term... Somebody said that question to me. You know, I'd point to Miles Davis and stuff when I was 21. Yeah. And I was listening to the Miles Davis Quintet, my favorite jazz... But then, you know, it changes all the time. It's a bit like food. I don't think you can say, you know, so I'm curious about what you love listening to. Wow. You, you would be surprised. <laughs> uh, I would say I don't listen to jazz at all uh, right now. Good. I celebrate that. <laughs> I absolutely celebrate that because I'll tell you what I mean is that one of the things I try to, I have this exercise with all my students. I play them a piece of music. It could be my most favorite piece of music. I say to them, I play the music. When you've heard enough, put your hand up and stop me and give me a score out of 10. 10 out of 10, I love this. I want to learn it. Not out of 10, boring. Next, I never want to hear this again. And I don't care if it's my favorite piece of music. And I've also had them play me pieces of music that they think this is my their favorite and I hate it. Yeah. And I'll say, that's cool, you want to learn this? Let's learn scales, let's learn arpeggios through this. So then you get this connection with what you really like. Because it's like food. I think of it like food. And maybe we agree some things taste fantastic, but people have to trust what they respond to. They have to get this connection. Like, I don't care if I hate the Beatles or I hate... Bach, good. So if somebody says to me, I never listen to jazz, I say, good. Because <laughs> what I celebrate is the individual's choice, you know. Yeah, I mean, just because it's the harmonica or the blues harp, you know, like some of my students are into film music and we just play some film music, you know. We don't have to mm -hmm. play blues. Or I don't want to force like any jazz improvisation on them or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, I'm listening to a lot of South African music, actually. I'm listening to a lot really? of uh, the, the pop stuff, like the Emma Piano 
stuff. Great. I like that a lot right now. Are there any particular tracks you'd recommend? Oh, I, I can send you some, but like, I'm... Yeah. Would you do that? Would you send me a playlist of stuff that you like? I, I would really love that. Yeah. Because, you know, I, 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 I'd love that, yeah. And tell me, how did you come across the South African stuff? Did you just find it online or...? Oh, I just like um, started out producing more and more. And then I got, after doing like some hip hop stuff and like German hip hop stuff, I somehow got into the Dutch pop music. So they have a lot of African influence. And <clears throat> that's how I got into like the whole Afro kind of world and Afro beat and started to work with Nigerian artists. And then like at some point, like the singer I'm working with, he was like, oh, the next big thing is Emma Piano. You got to check it out. Send me some Emma Piano beats. You got to produce that. So, hmm. yeah. I, I didn't realize that you produce music. Yeah, I, I mean, no, I've always a... done it at the side. Um, mm -hmm. I really do enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm really into the bright stuff of Emma Piano. There's like a very dark side of it, which is just, mm -hmm. just minor and like one chord, basically, you know. But I also like the bright stuff. And then it's always uh, super exciting. Like some of the songs really just start out modally like just like one key center and you don't know whether it's going to be minor or major and then it's kind of a kind of a surprise moment when the when the chords start to join you know mm -hmm. so yeah I can send you some sort of a playlist I'd love that so, so tell us about your South African connection. So your father is from there, right? Yes, I grew up in South Africa. And my father was the musical director of um, a famous musical called King Kong. And um, King Kong was not about the monster. It was about a black boxer. But what was special about this musical is that um, it reunited, this was in late 50s, early 60s, it got a huge number of the most talented art, black artists, township artists together, plus the combination of a very um, liberal white production team working together under apartheid. And it produced this musical, which was not, it was not like a political act, but the collaboration between blacks and whites was politically very significant and um, it became it was very successful in South Africa and then it came to London and played in the West End for six months okay and it was the musical in which many South African you know world artists Hugh Masekela Miriam Makeba um, they were discovered via this musical and after the musical Miriam went to the United States Hugh Masekela left and became a, a legend um and so i mean these people I, i've known them personally since i was a kid i was six years old when when I, I went to the musical when i was six and i remember it yeah you know and then my dad um he went overseas with the cast when they went to london and i didn't see him for six months so uh, basically from there i had this passion for south african jazz south african township music and uh, but I I really I came to live in London in my 20s and I'm 67 now. And yeah. so my I learned South African jazz in London from records. And then in 2010, uh, well, 2006, I produced an album of uh, with with the Manhattan Brothers, who were the four key people in the musical. It was like the lead guy and the co-lead. They had a vocal group which sang this close harmony. You know, like, um,
that kind of thing. Uh, and I used to learn the lyrics and accompany them. Yeah. And we did some gigs. We did some amazing, um, uh, we did some quite amazing gigs. We went to Vienna in 1998 and did a project with Joe Zawinul of Weather Report, uh, which was, wow. you know, it, it was, uh, I could talk to you for hours about it. Anyway, um, so so I'm, I produced an album of theirs in 2006. And then a few years later, I produced my own harmonica album, um, which was released in South Africa and won this award, which is uh, up there, that silver thing, you know, my one moment of fame in glory, uh, South African Can Grammy. show award. it to the viewers? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, well, if there it is. is. <laughs> uh, so, this is, this is a summer award. Um, so it was quite incredible for me because I never thought I would get back into s I, I would never thought I'd get into music I came to it very late and so that's where I have a lot of time for people who, who want to learn um, at any time you know I'll yeah. teach people where middle C is on the piano I'll teach them hole one you want to know where I'll teach you where hole one it's this hole here you blow C or you can play Donna Lee You know, I mean, I'll teach at any level. Yeah. Uh, I kind of, I just kind of love the whole spectrum of it all, you know. And then, you know, the other thing, Constantin, is that, um, you know, you get young guys like yourself or Matthias, who I'm, I'm old enough to be your grandfather probably, but you guys can wipe the floor with me, you know, technically speaking. Maybe I can place, I, I mean, I'm not knocking myself, but the the thing that older people are living with is that, the younger generations have developed such common, m unbelievable chops. You know, Philippa Scheel here in... He's an unbelievable player. Yeah. Um, Matthias is fantastic. Yeah, and now Nobody... I see people, like young kids, 13, and they are playing amazing. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. You know, Because they're listening to you, and they're thinking, hey, I've got a harmonica. I'm going to see what Constantine's doing, and then they suss it out, you know. So I think you know, all, all I'm saying is that I'm very much into supporting people where they are. And I, I found myself in orchestras or like, you know, I, did, I also did a session with Sting. You know, it was interesting hearing Sean Sagar talk about it. Yeah. I, I had my moment with Sting. And New Day. And, and, you know, if you were a harmonica player, you get popped into these situations. Um, and... The thing is, that you think, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> you know, and it's because you're the only person that can play the harmonica that they know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My session with Sting, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, 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 it's a wonderful, it's a kind of broad world. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting world. And because I started so late, I've still got a lot of passion for it. Well, that's good. What's your advice for people out there how to maintain the passion for the instrument? I think there's three things. The one is that you need to have some awareness of what you really love musically. You know, this is where I'm very interested in playlists that people have. What do you listen to? What do you love? When... You know, when you were 16, what music was meaningful to you then? You know, and you find most people have a world of their own music. We all have yeah. like our own musical world. And if if suddenly you and I think, ah, oh, yeah, Jethro Tull, remember Aqualung, 1970. And you think, what the hell is he talking <laughs> about? Or you think, yeah, I discovered that as well. I love that. You, you see, so I think when you have an intersection with someone else, that's very exciting. And then the rest of the time, it's live and li let live. You like apples, I like oranges, and that's cool. And so I, I think that that freedom is really important. That's the number one thing. The other thing is that you need to have some awareness of the negative stuff going on in your head, which is often silent. It's like an iceberg, which is not recognized. And you come across somebody who can do something and you just, it, it takes you down, you know. 
like if I, you know, it, it can it can destroy your morale or think you've got no 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 um you, you no hope of going further. You think your limitations are too extreme, and then the third thing is that you need some kind of supportive context. You know, you need to be. You need to have your instrument, and then you need to be in touch with other people, even if it's by phone or Zoom or go down to your local pub. You, you need some connect. So if you've got those three yeah. things, you know, and and um, you know what makes one person nervous can be no problem for someone else, and vice versa. You know, so I'm very into. Oh, you cut off at that sentence. Let's see. If you're coming back. Okay, I think I'm still online. Hope uh, Adam can join us again. Hello, chat. Enjoy harmonica. Great. Thank you for tuning in. Yeah. Let us know from where you're tuning in. Also, what kind of music you're listening to. We did talk about that a little, right? Now I can see me two times. Let me do... That was the wrong button. Let me try moving over to this. Wow, this is big. Hmm. I'm just going to keep it here. This might be confusing, right? Live main. There we go. All right. Oh, from the UK too. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, I really hope that I can return to the festival. Um, it's awesome. And Autumn, Adam told me that it's taking place in Birmingham now. Um, I think I was there in 2012. So that was in Bristol back then. And I played there with a fantastic guitarist here from Germany. His name is Hanno Busch. We played some duo stuff. I had some problems with my guitar effect pals. <laughs> so I really enjoyed using them at that time. Nowadays, not using them too often anymore. Uh, I like to play acoustically, especially in the classical setting. And I... Right now, I prefer to just have the microphone in front of me and have a lot of freedom moving around, um, using the hand effects and also influencing the timbre of the harmonica um, because I'm not a huge fan of all the high frequencies in the instrument and I just try to EQ it with my hands and make it sound a little more warm. Hey, Shervin! Hope you did work out today. <laughs> let me check Adam did send me his uh, phone number so maybe we can connect there and see what's up and at the same time yeah I should do uh, Twitch live very soon I gotta do some gotta practice a little I'm hitting the studio next week with some jazz stuff with the pianist and the week after we are still working on uh, financing the whole thing. We're recording with the orchestra in a church, and it's time to practice. Uh, only two days, and we're going to record s almost 60 minutes of music. So that's definitely a challenge. Let me see. Adam did send me his phone. I'm gonna create a contact and send him a WhatsApp. Adam Glasser, not Glasper. <laughs> Enjoy harmonica. Oh, thank you. I love doing these. Just staying in touch with the harmonica community and the harmonica world is awesome. Uh, we also have the fantastic Discord server which should be linked in the description box below. The Harmonica's Discord server where you can join. We got the monthly Harmonica challenges going on. 
with monthly prizes and you can just ex exchange there's also like, like a german corner if you only want to write german messages but it's international i think we're at like 600 members which is i mean that's quite a lot for discord and harmonica oh yeah adam was calling through facetime but it's not reaching my computer let's see Check one, two, check one, two. Yes, I'm on my phone right now. I'm so sorry, Matt. This is, this is my internet. It's just failed. Okay, I see. Yeah, I'm just trying to um, entertain the audience right now. Unfortunately, I couldn't pick this up from my computer. completely not your fault. This is Virgin Media's fault, everybody. Okay. We can continue this conversation, but this is Virgin Media. I have been on at them for the last month. Yeah. Street. Yeah. Is, is it possible for me to talk to your audience like this? Yeah, I mean, let me try to call you using FaceTime from my computer because this only reached my phone. I don't know why. Right. Okay. I should have been able to pick it up from my computer too. Yeah. Okay. So let me open FaceTime on my computer and then I'll call you from there. Okay, technical challenges. I'm calling Adam using FaceTime. Let's see. We're connecting, we're connecting. Oh, okay, let me uh, readjust some stuff. Because right now you're coming through the, the internal speakers. Hmm. Oh, this way you can see me. Yeah. But I don't know why... How can I change the output here? Oh, yeah. Let me set it to... I'm gonna use this microphone and then use the multi output here. That's nice. So I'm just gonna. At least we can continue. Yeah, we definitely can. Just. Uh... I'll, I'll keep trying to. Um, I'll keep. I'll, I'll keep trying to. Let me see. Just the output thing doesn't really work. Oh wow, it's coming through the speakers of my second screen. That's wrong. I can't set it to multi-output, which is basically necessary for people to hear you. I don't know, let me check it. Now I should hear you through my audio interface. Yeah, that's that's good. But now you're still not out there for the people with your voice. Um, <laughs> we did talk about these, the software. <laughs> I'm using a software called Black Hole. But yeah, with that, you're creating like a multi-output device. And unfortunately, using FaceTime, click on it, clicking on it again. It may be that, that this comes back. Yeah, that doesn't work. Let me check my uh, settings here. Multi-output. It doesn't send out to the screen so that's weird because i if i choose it as an output device in facetime i hear the audio from the speakers the internal speakers of my second screen 
which is not part of the multi-output device I created. So that's weird. Okay. Um, so we're back in business. I'm going to sign off on FaceTime. Yeah. Okay. So we should be, we should be back in business. Adventurous. Yeah. We are back. You know I don't yeah. know where we left off though. <laughs> Man, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I just tried to entertain everyone <laughs> and uh, yeah. tell them yeah. about can the you, Discord server and stuff. Can you tell how many people are with us? Oh, we lost some, but there are 15, I think. Oh, well, that's not bad. And it's going to be available on YouTube, isn't it? Yeah, it's still like a, a link that can yeah. be accessed afterwards. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Well, so yeah, we definitely know, did talk about uh, taste and that you basically should yeah, so play you, you whatever on the harmonica. South Africa, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it's funny, but there, there are very few chromatic players in South Africa. Oh yeah, that's and, interesting. And, and blues, blues players, there, there's a lot of blues players. Wow. Uh, and there are also um, South African like ethnic players people who have in fact there used to be a minister in the government called Collins Chabani if you if you google him Collins Chabani he actually played the harmonica um, I'll, I'll put his name and he made he made like a blues album and I was hoping to get a kind of project going with you know uh, kids and so on and sadly he was killed in a car crash oh wow um, this was like, you know, maybe 10 years ago. Um, and so he was the one champion of the harmonica. That's interesting. So I do remember mm. like uh, maybe last year I messaged you and you did tell me that you played some shows down there. Yes. Yes. I. So I, how, how often are you in South, South Africa then? Like, do you visit regularly? I try to, I try to, but um, it's kind of um, lockdown basically cancelled a lot of live work, as you can imagine. And so it's taken me a while since the end of lockdown. I, I was there last April and I did an eight piece band project of South African jazz. I did a bit of harmonica, but I was playing mostly keyboard. Yeah. And um, I, I, it was great. F I went there for three weeks. And I'm trying to get out there again, but it's quite difficult um, to to get work there. You know, I find it not not easy to, you know, I've got lots of places I could set up and play, but to make it to make it work financially is is quite tricky. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm still, you know, very very involved in South African jazz. I, I have got a, uh, a six piece band here, and we're doing a gig in in May which will involve, um, you know, playing South African charts, horn charts, tunes I've transcribed. And I've got an album which is yet to be released, uh, which has got South African musicians on it as well. And we're basically looking at South African jazz standards that are less well known. One of the things I really enjoy doing is finding a South African jazz tune and then doing it on the harmonica, you know, in a kind of township style. So we, my second album, Mzanzi, is, has got a lot of tracks. Yeah, got I wanted to talk about that one happening. because that's also the one I included in my Instagram story, like the opening song. Yes. Well, yes. What does well, that you mean? See, that song, Radebe, R-A-D-E-B-E, is, you know, in, in Zulu um, and, and Kosa, they have what they call clan names. Clan is like a term for uh, for family you know they have like a clan name and there was a very famous South African bass player called Johnny um, Gianni who played with Abdullah Ibrahim and there's an amazing album which I discovered in 1983 called Witch Doctor's Son and uh, when I heard this tune 
it just completely killed me. It's like a <laughs> And it's got this very cool bass line which goes So um, I heard this this tune that tune is called Khadebe. Uh, the R is pronounced like a Kha sound. Okay. And, and that tune, um, I thought this is fantastic. It's the clan name. Dudu wrote that tune for Johnny Diane. Dudu Pokwana was the sax player um, that I worked with in the mid-80s. And he wrote that tune for, for, for Johnny Diane. And it's on this album, Witch Doctor's Son. So I thought that would be very cool to do on the harmonica. Um, so that's where you hear the title title track but the other crazy thing is that you can play the melody of that on a C instrument that's awesome you may have to cross the thing but you know so so anyway that's that's the you know that's the thing that I, I really liked. And then, you know, I've been interested in taking like a normal jazz standard uh, and then giving it maybe a kind of different groove. Like, you know, there's a tune which goes, I, I can't really stop my key, but um, I'm old fashioned. So then I would get a groove that goes. And then, you know, yeah. get, and then I've got a little line which uses the two C's. I made up a sort of thing which goes. See, that's interesting. I couldn't find that D to start with. <laughs> and, and so on, like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, I get, I, I, I'm excited to talk about all of this. So yeah, that's wonderful. It do, is uh, such, a, in such and... a nice flavor. Yeah, so, you know, South African, uh, I mean, there's so much great melody and groove and so on. And so it's, 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 it makes it especially kind of poignant for me to be outside South Africa. And that's the jazz scene here in London in the mid 80s was full of South African expatriates that had fled apartheid, were based in London. And there was such a vibe, you know, uh, on my album, you hear the singer Penise Saul from East London, which is not the East London here in London. It's East London in, in South Africa. And they've got just, they've listened, she's listened to Danny, to Ella Fitzgerald. They've, they've all listened to the American jazz, but then added their own thing to it. And that's the same thing that's happening with, um, with Gom and Amapiano. Uh, is like South Africans are really hip listeners. You know, yeah, right, really hip. They'll 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 have listened to all that stuff and then they'll put in their own stuff, I, I, and and then you got this crazy musical, uh, like new forms. It's got new. It's got life to it. Which, I, I, maybe I'm just proudly South African, but I I think we do it better than anyone else in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. getting shot down with that. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, also with the Emma piano stuff there. There's some jazzy I'm a piano stuff out there. There's so much like roads in there and just like jazzy chords. Mm. Very common. Yeah, yeah. So your instrument looks very 
contemporary, very modern. Like, can you tell everyone what you're playing? This harmonica. Yeah. Oh, this is the CX12. Exactly. This is the legendary CX12. I've had these. I've got a couple of white CX12s, um, which I've had for like 20 years. Brendan Power introduced me to the CX12. And the reason that I like it is because it fits nicely in my hand. And also, it, it helps me to sound different. I think it's quite hard to achieve your own sound on the harmonica. And there are not many... I mean, I've done film scores on this, you know, with a film score I did with Toots. Um, you know, I, I had a few cues on this film, Hard Rain, many years ago. And I used a CX-12. And a lot of people look down on it. And it, it does does have a particular color. So yeah. I don't use exclusively a CX-12. But I think, you know, it's great because you can pull this out and clean the slide and yeah. fiddle with the wind savers without any hassle. And, um, you know, but, it's, you know, when I listen to, like, Antonio playing a standard Hona 264 straight out the right. box, I think, man, should I get one of those, <laughs> you know? And then when I hear Matthias Heiser playing a GM48, I think, ah, oh, maybe I could get a GM48. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think that the physics show that it's, you know, because our mouths and our heads are part of the sound box. I, I think it's got very little to do with the harmonica. I think in a way, one of the things I love about the harmonica is it's the most egalitarian instrument. It's like, you can't, it's not like you can pay 4,000 pounds and get an instrument that's better than anybody else's. You know, you right. could have something and if you learn to set it up yourself and you know about, you've got a sound in your head, you'll, you'll sound amazing. That's you know? true. Yeah, it just sound absolutely amazing. Um, yeah. I want to get these uh, white covers. Oh, these? Yeah. I don't think Hona make them anymore. I mean, they they did Hona make them like themselves? What? Pardon? They, they did make them themselves, the white what, ones? These? Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, wow, I didn't know. There's a, there's a purple one as well. I had a purple one, but it got lost in the post. But they're these white ones. And also when I came to visit the Strossingen uh, with Richard Weiss back in 2011, he gave me a whole lot of incredible colored um, um, uh, outside cases. And, and one of them is actually my favorite harmonica still. Maybe you know, they still I'll have you, one or two. Hang on. You want to see some crazy <laughs> yeah. harmonicas? One second. Uh, I mean, I just want to change things up, you know? But I think the actual shape of the mouthpiece is it'll, a little different. It'll on take the... me time. It'll take me time to find. I won't, I won't keep everyone waiting. But next time, I, I've got one which, you know, Gabby from Hona. Yeah, you know, she's one of the women that that, that she, that she she was very sweet to me in 2012 because she gave me a CX12 which has the most fabulous color scheme on it. It's like got a, they made some incredible um, outer covers, you know. And she she gave me one, and um, you know they they were great. I, I I were you at that one where Michael Timler and a whole team from Hona came. Um, and and they did like workshops how to tune it was incredibly useful yeah. and michael timler brought out these this tuning guide like you know the whole idea that you learn to fix it yourself i mean that that was pioneered by hona you know which was which i mean i still can't really fix my own harmonicas i rely on a shout out for john cook do you know john cook okay i don't but john yeah that's cook, interesting he's a legend check him out John Cook is the official Hona um, repair person here in the UK, but he's not just a harmonica repair. He, 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 came, he came from repairing instruments and he's an absolutely brilliant technician. Check him out on Facebook. Um, he, he's, he, he knows how to set up harps. He, he's got like, I, I can't I get tongue tied if, if I try and describe how good he is. 
I should I should send him my CX12 Jazz. Huh? <laughs> I promise you, he'll it'll come back like immaculately, and he's not expensive. He's considering his expertise. Um, he's very reasonable, you know, uh, an amazing guy. I've been to his place. Um, it's in Essex in Hornchurch, and um, and you check him out, and he does videos. He's just um, he, he 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 he'll probably he's comes along to the harmonica conventions and he, he gives workshops and he's the quality of his teaching and his workmanship and his whole approach is absolutely stunning i mean he's a gift he's a national treasure you know wow yeah mm. like so, i feel so like on I, the i'll send you his details and um that would be awesome you, sorry i'm talking so much you must shut me up constantine i gotta i gotta yeah. fix this one like i think like some of the some of the wind savers are lost and stuff you know Yeah, He, and I sometimes like to you. play it, especially like so. Sometimes like with pop music, especially like the chromatic just works better than the diatonic, just sound wise. Mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. I should play chromatic on this. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'd you'd get it together quite, quite quick. You know, well. I feel like the mouthpiece is a little different on the CX12 Jazz, right? It is. It's narrower. And okay. what they did was they shaved, they shaved this down. Right. Um, so again, I think it's like horses for courses. My embouchure is very much like a U block. I got. So, for me to, I don't really like the CX12 jazz for my playing because it causes my my embouchure to be flatter. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which which doesn't suit me, but. Some people really like it, and also because your lips are kind of more, you don't have to open as much, you don't have to open your mouth, some people find that an advantage, but, I, you know, it's the kind of thing which, if I played it a lot, I'd probably grow to love it, so if, if people like it, I say good luck to them, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's great. I, I wish that Hona would bring this out with a with a more modern mouthpiece. If you brought out a mouth, uh, if you brought out... The same, because the, the reeds and the reed plates are basically very good. But if you brought out something that looked like a mini CX-12, you know, you just want something that, because th this crenellated thing here, you know, the profile of this, I don't really, I find it very hard. You, you want to be able to move smoothly and get used to a completely smooth mouthpiece. And yeah. I mean, the idea behind this, this thing, which is, this is more than 10 years old because... Yeah, it's of course about feeling 2011. where you are on the instrument, right? Yeah, but you 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 need to develop that spatial awareness that if you go up an octave, True. you you can't rely on feeling where the holes are. And I'm against putting notches and all that kind of stuff. I think it would be great. And again, if anyone's listening, put the whole numbers in really clearly, because oh, really? you want to be able to pardon. Oh really? Okay. Absolutely. I if if it was down to me, I'd say put the whole numbers really super clear, as clear as possible, because um, if you if you know, I, I've seen Gregoire Marais, I've seen him with Herbie Hancock on the stage here, and he's about to play some ridiculously brilliant tune like Actual Proof, ba da ba ba da ba ba da ba da, -da you know all of that, and I just see him checking out his whole numbers. You know, this was in 2008, oh, yeah. so maybe he doesn't need to anymore. But wow. I, I think most of us, if you've got something that you really is important, be 100% right. You know, uh, I'm very much into checking out the whole numbers. And I'll even hold in a session, I'll literally put my, my finger like that so that I, if I'm going to start on the lower C, I'm on the lower C and there's no doubt about it because I don't trust myself, you know. Oh, wow. That's interesting because I'm the total opposite. But I'll like... tell you something crazy. <laughs> really? Yeah, I feel what, like what, I what never you, look at it, what, and I also tell my students, "Don't look at a harmonica like before you put it into your mouth." Oh, really? Yeah, yeah really. Just like so, I mean, you should just get used to playing the right hole from the beginning. Yeah, Correct. I feel like uh, that. That's what I. That's what I practiced, and I mean, it's just about the ear. And then I tell students, like, if they want to hit. Seven hole blow, for example, and hit that high C on the C harmonica. Don't look, but 
if you don't hit it, try to find it and keep the air moving. So that's I the exercise. See. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of you know, I... doing this and then like lo losing the the number out of your outside, you know? Yeah. That's a, you know, you've just changed my life. Because <laughs> I've got to practice that. You know, if you said play, let's say an F sharp, I don't know if I could do that. I, I couldn't. I, I'm not used to doing that. Well, that's interesting. Um, if, if I if I hear, all I need to do is hear one note, and I know where I am. But yeah. If you said from complete scratch, play. Let's see. Play. You see, I, anything that's like close to the end, an E flat, or B flat, that's no problem. Okay. But if I if you said play whole four, draw. Um, draw C. <laughs> I've looked at it, so I've cheated. <laughs> but yeah. I, I think I need to just practice that. How Maybe, about you know, hole eight blow with a slide in? That was right. No, that's that's not the that's the wrong hole. That I played I played an A flat. But what you, hole eight blow with a slide in is this. And that wasn't even hole eight. That was hole nine with the slide in. Um, oh wow, I'm confused. I thought the A flat was on hole eight. No, the the A flat is. Oh, you're right. It's on seven. Yeah, that's that's my fault. <laughs> I'm not good at the chromatic. Once I once I know the hole, once I hear my ear is in, I'm in. But that that I say that honestly, that is a weakness in my playing. But that's interesting that because I, I thought about this. So something similar comparing the chromatic and the diatonic because at some point we got like composers to write classical pieces for harmonica plus piano. Uh, so there were like seven compositions and one of them had just like so many long and held notes and I could have played it on the regular G harmonica like a diatonic one but I was never really happy with it so... We also recorded it, and I just had to do it on the chromatic and learn how to sight read a little, and yeah, just make it work. But I was like, every single time we performed it live, I I just didn't feel good about it because it's hard for me to like visualize myself playing the instrument and feeling the notes when not playing the actual instrument. You know, like. I can imagine playing everything on this right now in my mouth, in my mind. Yeah. And I know how it feels like, and I can be absolutely sure that I'm going to hit all the notes in 10 minutes on stage, you know? But I can't do it here. Like, these, the, the additional physical action of, like, also, like, yeah, using the slide, I, yeah, don't, don't really get it together in my, my head. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> it makes a hundred percent sense, but then you know the funny thing so is So like ten minutes before the performance I would go through the piece of my mind with the chromatic, but I wouldn't feel safe, you know? Right. Right. Do you memorize music easily? Yeah. I would say so. Yeah. See, I, I think that it's, that's kind of interesting as well. I you know, I'm certain that if you played the chromatic a lot and if you wanted to play it, that's the key thing is how much do you want when you're so uh, when you have your whole world of your of your um, of your instrument, would you want to play it? It's the same with this is that the amount of time it would take me um, to get familiar with this. You know, Phil Hopkins, do you know him? I don't Phil know. Hop Phil Hopkins is a very good, excellent chromatic player, and he does. A, he's a drummer, and he works a lot in the West End here on shows. He's like worked for years in shows. In fact, I once did a depth for him, which I can tell you about, which was a lot of fun. But he plays a four octave, and he has no problem picking it up and just playing it. And to me, um, I'm not that keen on. <laughs> 
those notes really don't interest me that much. The only thing that I have been working at is the um, is the 14 hole because that goes down to the G and I find that very useful and worthwhile and mm, I've yeah. got a CX-12 I'll show it to you this is unique 14 hole um, anybody in the chat which note is that <laughs> somebody with perfect pitch you think that only Hona makes a CX-12 well, I got news for you. This is a Brendan Power CX-12. Yeah. And it's got these extra notes on it, which is brilliant. So it's got this, this range of notes. But the great thing is those extra notes give it the same range as a violin. So you can play. True, um, yeah. I can't even find the key. I'll find the key and then I'll show you what I mean. So there's, there's all of that on this, which I wish Hona would make a CX-12, which had the extra two holes. Now, what Brendan did is, I don't know if you can see this, but he cut two yeah, just CX-12s put the two in together. two, and he, he put these together, and he did the same with the body, but these are Suzuki reeds. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. He's got Suzuki reeds on them, and... um. And then he made this for me in 2004 for 300 pounds. And this is a gold dust instrument. It's a fantastic instrument. And the problem is now, if I said to Brendan, would you make a nice? No, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> He's busy doing his lucky seven and his multiple tunings. Yeah. He's not interested. I mean, I'd have to pay him, you know, when somebody would have to pay me, say, Brendan, make a nice. He could do it with his eyes shut. But it's like he's such a creative designer that he's just not interested in those anymore. <laughs> so if I lose that, I'm, I'm stuck. It's over. Because the alternative, <laughs> which is... Um, the al what did I do? Oh, yeah. The alternative, which is it's a very good harmonica, is, is the, the SCX 48, 56. Okay. You know. It's a great harmonica. But in a way... I wish I had a spare CX-12, CX-14. Yeah. Wow. But this presents, I tell you this, you know, coming back, uh, sorry, I if I'm talking too much, stop me, because I'm no, very excited. No, this is awesome. Talk, yeah. But um, the thing is, Constantine, is that it's, it's taken me a long time to become vaguely secure on this instrument because I'm so used to the C being down here yeah. that... In these bottom, I can so easily get lost, you know. So I've done a lot of practice where I'm going. <laughs> just to get vaguely used to that, because once you stop, stop thinking about it, and then I, I get lost here. I still get lost a lot on the harmonica. And I think if I'd started it very young, I'd get less lost. But hey, better better late than never. <laughs> but I think you just come. I back only to have what ten said, holes, so I think. <laughs> say again. I only have ten holes, so <laughs> that's a little easier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you've got your three D model in your mind. I mean, that to me is awesome. You know, to to have that, and you know, the other thing is that I think it's a great idea. I've never thought of just saying, go for the note and blow until you find it. Yeah. And keep the note going. You know, I think that's a great idea. Um, and, and really, I should just devote 15 minutes a day to doing that for the next six months. 
then I'd be able to do what you do. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah, at least I start good, on like, the right note after that. Because th that's like, there, there was like a whole Levy's online school, online thing. He was like, you know what? The breath, that's your eyesight on the instrument. Like, only if you're breathing, then you know where you are. That's a great point. That's so, an yeah. absolutely great point. Because once you stop breathing, how do you know where you are? <laughs> yeah. And you know, that's the other thing is that I sometimes hit a wrong note and I'm completely, it's like I've fallen over on a motorway. I would too on the and chromatic. Imagine trying to cross a motorway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and maybe that's, maybe that's what I was afraid of, like playing this piece too. Hitting one wrong note and not knowing where I am. Here we go again. Yeah. There exactly. Was a freeze like there, but it wasn't a catastrophic. Maybe that was what I was afraid of playing this piece on the chromatic, like playing one wrong note and not knowing where I am anymore. You know. Right. Well, if you do enough ear training, I think you can do that, but. The problem is, um, you know, with this piece of music, everyone wants to play Midnight Cowboy. You know, if I mean, loads of people try to do that, and Midnight Cowboy is is a is 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 a minefield with the double C's. Because um, the the problem with it is that, you know, you've got this thing. It goes. Then it's got this this um, section. In fact, can I screen share? I, I'm going to show you something. Oh, let's see. Because this is every Maybe everybody who wants to play Midnight Cowboy. Can you see this? Yeah, perfect. I'm gonna. Okay, so so have a look at this letter B here. So we've got. Now, and then the next time. Oh, yeah. See, so now that the, that double C thing there is 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 a real trap because, you know, the, the, I've, I've done this piece several times with an orchestra. And part of the so problem this is, is how it's being played using the two different C's. Well, I, I think that that's how people have done that. Okay. Because I don't see how, you know... You don't want to change whole when you're going from C sharp to C to B. And here... Now, maybe I don't need to do that stuff, but... You need to be able to know that you're going on to hole five with the slide in. Otherwise, if you get to the second phrase and you go, or you, you're catastrophically exposed in an orchestra. Do you see? Wow. So, so that's the kind of thing where I think it's really important to be to 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 know where you are um, on on your on your instrument and, and to have a system i mean i practiced that for ages because you know what it is you turn up for a gig i i haven't done a lot of orchestral gigs you know so you get there and you think shit i've got to do this right and then yeah they're playing the whole evening of of john barry music and then you've got one shot you've got that and then the other thing you do is dances with wolves and then that's it then you can take off your tuxedo and go home and everyone else and it's it's a lonely life being an harmonica player in some ways, but but that that thing I sp every time I get to do that I'll spend two weeks beforehand just practicing that, just to make it secure. Yeah, I'm interested in like how you articulate on the instrument because like if I would just read like the sheet music, and of course I don't know how it's being played I would just like play, firefall blow. <laughs> 
and just articulate with my tongue, you know? Yeah. Um, I think, I think it kind of depends, you know, if you're playing your own music, you, it's up to you how you play it. If you're doing a session and I, I used to get asked a lot of the time, I'd say, okay, I'm going to really try and play this legato. And I go, And I do my best legato, and they say, that was really great, but um, can you do legato now? Yeah. And I think, ah, that was my best legato. <laughs> you know? And so this joining of the notes, I think, is on the chromatic, is, is, is one of the toughest things. And I think that, you know, you're really accomplished musical players. The classical training, uh, or just playing you know, long melodies. I mean, I, I always came up wanting to play like Amazing Changes, you know. Beep, I hold harmonica, you know. And and it's only later that I spent a lot of time just trying to play simple legato lines. But it's an illusion, you know. Jim Hughes is very good at this. He says, you really have to think of the end of the note. And and most people don't listen to the end of the note, oh, yeah. or the end of the phrase. You know, um, they've kind of they come to an end and then they're on to the next note, but they haven't ended with focus. And and I think that you can only do that if you're going to do really simple things. You know, uh, Roni Eiten, who I, do you know him? Have you come across him, Roni Eiten, oh. Israeli player? He is astounding technically. And musically, he's a lovely guy, really interesting. I mean, I'd say, you know, everyone's got their favorite of the next generation. I'd say Roni, Matthias Heiser, and, and, and Antonio are the three people that I wish I could do everything they do. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else is very good. I love them. There's lots of things that they can. And Ivonik Pren is also really serious. Man, that guy's a serious jazz guy, you know. Um, and there are probably others that if I thought about. But I, I have a question for you, Constantine. I'm talking, talking so much. Have you ever been to Taiwan? No, no, not yet. You know, um, there is um, there's a, a harmonica player. I don't know. I chatted to him briefly on, on Facebook Messenger. His name is Rolabo Lin. And he, these guys, um, you know, when I was in Trossingen, they had orchestras and instrumentalists from the far east and they'd be in that cafeteria and they would be jamming on flight of the bumblebee <laughs> like you and i say hey what do we know oh yeah let's jam on summertime or let's play a blues yeah. they jam on this virtuoso stuff while they're having their tea and coffee and it's phenomenal the language that they share and the virtuosity and the standard and it's like there's 15 or 20 people that can all play in time with really good rhythmic articulation and you know my jaw just drops but Rolabo Lin check him out I, I forget the name of his group but they they specialize in classical pieces and they have a culture of harmonica teaching and education and support and they're in a different league to everybody else wow, it's only yeah. because Maybe they're stuck in Taiwan and it's not commercial. But the musicality and the precision, the world-class virtuosos, you know. I think Sai Leo comes from that kind of background as well, you know. But he's branched out into other stuff. But sometimes I think, oh, yeah, you know, teach the harmonica. I mean, you've got to start when you're six. <laughs> and by the time you're 12, you can play Bumblebee. And by the time you're 20, the best of you will be able to do anything you know um yeah and then you have to think actually you know what i've also got my little corner of the harmonica world to to plant to grow things on you know yeah so wow. so yeah i'm exciting I, yeah so many players out there yeah and one keeps hearing of players that you've never heard of and they're just amazing you know very true. Mm. Yeah, we sometimes hear some of these like uh, in these monthly harmonica challenges. So we always have like a new topic. And I think last month we did 
like a soul harmonica challenge. I think we was like, I, I just searched for some near soul backing tracks and told everyone like which harmonica to use and stuff. But it's always different and there are amazing submissions all the time from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, awesome. Yeah, we did a beatboxing, harmonica beatboxing challenge. All different musical styles like Irish music and crazy position stuff on the harmonica, on the diatonic. Stevie Wonder challenge. So yeah. I'm always thinking about new topics. Have you one? I tell you who who you must interview. Pat Levitt. Do you okay. know Pat Levitt? I only heard his name before. Pat Levitt is a British drummer. He's a seriously good drummer. But check out just Google Pat Levitt Stevie Wonder series. What he's done during lockdown is he's taken a whole bunch of Stevie Wonder tracks. He's made backing tracks, very high quality. Then he's notated this. He's notated them all, and he pl plays himself chromatic, playing the Stevie Wonder tunes and solos, and that. And that's crazy. There's nothing to touch him doing that. It's just phenomenal. And and what is also amazing is that somebody, you see, he, he's a musician of a level that's toured and played professionally, and he's brought that level of rhythmic notation and quality of production to backing tracks. You know, most people are just in their room like me making a backing track and stuff. But he, he's done it with mates of his, and it's it's an, they're, they're on YouTube, you know, and you can check them out. It's fantastic. Crazy. But I, I think, you know, I, I, uh, I spoke to him at length, and I, I was hoping to do um, something, you know, like for Harmonica UK magazine, and then I didn't have the time, and uh, it's a long story. But... I, I really think he deserves attention, you know. Um, I think you, you'll be amazed by, by what, you know, he should be one of your, your people that you interview here. Crazy. I'm going to check him out. Yeah. 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 Pat Levitt, L-E-V. I'll just put his name in the chat here for you. Um, yeah, it says the Stevie Solo Series. Drums yes. and Percussion. Solo Series, yeah. And you can, I, I've actually bought his entire set of stuff from him. It's quite inexpensive. And what you get is you get, you get the backing tracks so you can practice it. And then you've got him playing, you know, uh, a video of him playing. And it's not like he's reading your know, stuff. He's just looking straight in the camera and he's playing. And he's got, he's, idiomatically, there's, there's no one to touch him. You know, I think I think he could give Sean a run if if Sean needed a debt depth for his sting gig, Sean Sagar, I think Pat could do it. <laughs> yeah. You know. Fantastic. When when can people expect your new record? Um, that's a good question. The guy who's mixing it is a wonderful engineer called Chris Lewis. He mixed my first two albums, and he is the sound engineer for Incognito. Did you know mm, the band yeah. Incognito? So back in 2007, I did a week with Incognito at, at a London venue. They, Bluey Mornick, he decided he wanted to have harmonica and flute uh, instead of his horn section. So I got, uh, I got to know Chris then, and he's mixing the album, and he's in Argentina at the moment. And uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to release it this year. You yeah. Know, um, it's, it's mainly South African jazz standards and it's recorded. Um, some of it is in London. Well, it's recorded in London, but some of it was with my regular band here who includes incredible guitarist Rob Luft. I don't know if you've come across him. He's very good. Uh, it's a great band. And then some of it is the, with the South African pianist Bokani Dyer. Um, who's an amazing, am amazing, you know, young contemporary pianist. And uh, we've, we've done a kind of unusual tunes. We've done, um, there's a, we've done some tunes by Becky and Seleku. The two pianists, fr jazz pianists, I would say the two major jazz pianists ever to come out of South Africa are, are obviously Abdullah Ibrahim and Becky and Seleku, who um, he, he's got 
like such a, he's got an incredible harmonic virtuoso compositional style and many of the pianists in South Africa like Bokani, Dyan, Africa and Kiza have got all that stuff down you know like it's incredibly difficult tunes um, but with a great vibe so we've, we've done a few of the easier ones you know one tricky one um, and then other tunes that I just really like a few originals so on wonderful wow yeah I'm looking forward so I linked all your social media links and whatever in the description box below mm -hmm. so everybody out there you can check that out you can visit the website what's the best uh, place to follow you and I would say get the Facebook, updates um, I'd say um, just check out um, Adam G harmonica you know my, my, my Instagram and Twitter harmonica uh, Instagram and Twitter and um, and and Facebook I usually will advertise my gigs on Facebook okay you know um, I don't have that many gigs at the moment um, I've been involved in other stuff, but some are coming up. I'm doing the Scarborough Jazz Festival later this year, um, and I've got a few things happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I already linked your Facebook and Instagram and everything. So mm. follow Adam on Instagram and Facebook, and yeah, maybe we can do something like this again. Meet up in person. I'd love that. Uh, I'd love that. Maybe yeah. do a challenge. I don't know. We'll see. Yes. But thank you for taking the time When to do this. That's a pleasure. That's a pleasure. Are, are your challenges, are they organized via Hona or do you do that yourself? Um, that's basically my thing, but Hona is supporting it by giving out the prizes. So we got three right. categories, oh, beginner, intermediate and advanced. So usually giving away three harmonicas. Oh, great. That's great. Two to the three winners, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just Good. like... Uh, Very cool. New tap topic all the time, and then <clears throat> me and another harmonica player, we are the judges, but basically just giving feedback, and in the end it's just a vote by... Yeah, the people viewing are voting for their favorites. Right. It's just like, and we can do, do like... A, it's a little pre-selection. Well? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chromatic players as well. Great. Also, maybe play one tune like uh, Shervin. He was in the chat here. He's from Iran and he played a piece by a Russian girl group. <laughs> it's kind of kind of solely jazzy, beautiful mm -hmm. melody. And I also like taught it to my students afterwards. Oh, great! Yeah, yeah. But on the diatonic, it's harder on the diatonic. But, yeah, always great to have some different harmonicas there. Oh, yeah, different types of harmonicas. Definitely. We had some harmonetta and s some of these chromatic instruments where you can, like, slide chromatically. Right. Bass, was it bass chromatic? No, uh, I'm not sure if we had bass chromatic yet. Hmm. But yeah, Hona used to make these like just like you can just slide over them and just it's just chromatic like. But all the notes are there. You don't have a slide. Yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. like a sound effect kind of. Mm. So yeah. Always interesting. We got to think of a topic, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, Constantin, I'm up for it. You know, I'm up for anything. Um, and that's uh, good. Yeah. It's been really great talking with you, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was That's fun. A pleasure. And um, everybody out there, I will update you. I will let you know about the next Hona Live, about this month's challenge. And yeah, see you very soon. Have a good evening, everybody. All right. You keep well. And thanks, everyone, for listening. And thanks to Konstantin. I've, I hope I haven't talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.